16 August uh, public meeting for the North Canberra Community Council. So, um, you know, thanks for coming. Uh, I was looking forward to this meeting because there's so many times that, you know, we're in the pub and we're trying to figure out how the whole voting system works. And everyone comes up with a different opinion. And no one actually has anyone of any knowledge to be able to refer to to say, hey, how does it really work? So. To uh, stop all that, we actually got someone from the uh, elections ACT, the Deputy Electoral Commissioner. So, um, really pleased to um, have uh, Rose Spence uh, show up tonight. So, I'll pass the meeting over to uh, Ro, and he'll tell you how to vote, not who to vote, how to vote. Okay, thanks. Great, right. thank you. Um, all right, well, thank you uh, all for uh, inviting me to attend your meeting. I've done this a, a number of Community councils in the last uh, uh, couple of months. It's uh, don't seem to get many in the out years, but uh, come an election year, I'm in high demand. Um, a lot of the other community councils have been more interested in things like the redistribution and voting services, but Mike here um, particularly asked for explanations of the Hare Clark electoral system. So. That's what I will be doing today, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions um, more specifically uh, aimed at the 2016 election. Um, so uh, hold on to those and uh, you can ask at the end of the presentation or throughout, it doesn't really bother me. Uh, my name is Rose Spence, I'm the Deputy uh, Electoral Commissioner. Um, Um, so I, I, I thought I'd talk about um, what's special about ACT uh, elections. Um, of course, one of the one of the uh, one of the aspects is the Hare Clark electoral system, but we'll, we'll get to that. There's a few other things that um, that are that are special about the ACT. Um, one being that we're a, a single house of parliament. Uh, there are two other uh, single houses of parliament um, in Australia. Uh, Northern Territory and Queensland, um, but we're the only House of Parliament that, that has uh, state and local government uh, responsibilities, um, or territory and local government responsibilities, um, and we're also the only uh, uh, Parliament that elects its members using a proportional uh, representation system, uh, which is which is Hare Clark. The other two single members, uh, single Houses of Parliament, Queensland and, and Northern Territory. Uh, have single member seats, a bit like the, the House of Representatives. Um, so we use the Haircock uh, proportional representation system, um, and we'll go in uh, into a bit of depth about how that all how that all works. Um, but another aspect of, of ACT elections that, um, well, at least when we started doing this presentation uh, many moons ago, was quite unique, but. Um, not so unique these days is the fact that we have fixed term elections. So we have elections every uh, the third Saturday in October every four years. The next one being the fifteenth of October this year. Um, that used to be quite a uh, quite a unique thing, um, but now um, really the only jurisdiction that doesn't have fixed term elections is, is the federal parliament, um, where they the, the prime minister can still. Um, Issue the writs and decide when the election will be. Tasmania doesn't actually have fixed term elections, but in practice it does because they released their election date so far advance. So um, whilst we used to be quite unique there, um, everyone, other electoral commissions, have, uh, other electoral jurisdictions have, have come on board with that fixed term uh, election. So what is Hare Clark? A um, little bit of jargon here. It's a quota preferential method of proportional representation. Um, and what that actually means is, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit, um, a quota a quota is the number of votes that a candidate needs to get uh, in order to be guaranteed uh, uh, to be elected. Um, so the easiest example of, of demonstrating what a quota actually is, um, is if you look at a single member seat uh, such as the House of Representatives, um, where you need more than 50% of the votes to be elected. Okay, so um, that is a quota. You, 
can't actually say what the, the definitive number is until you've actually know how many votes you've got. But the quota in a single member seat is 50% plus one, more than half. So that guarantees that the one can, that only one candidate can be elected. Two candidates can get 50%, only one candidate can get 50% plus one. So that's a quota in a single member seat, and we'll, we'll go into that a bit further with a, with a multi-member seat. A preferential method, uh, so if everyone understands in Australia really preferential voting, um, it's where an elector gets to write um, their choices, their wishes, onto a, onto a, onto a ballot paper. It's not a first-past-the-post election like uh, is used in, in presidential elections in America and, and many other um, systems in, in, in the world. Generally speaking, Australia uses preferential voting, and Hareclark is another form of, of preferential voting. And it's a form of preferential voting um, of proportional representation. And, and the idea behind proportional representation is that at the end of the election, when you count up all the votes, you're, you're electing multiple members to a single electorate. And the idea is that, that in a party system, and generally speaking, Australia uses party systems, uh, it's a bit very heavily um, based around parties, um, you can expect that if a party was to get 60% um, of, of, of the vote, that they would get more than half of the seats available. And that's a proportional representation system. The Senate is another example of a proportional representation system. Um, and so it's also, a, a, it's one of the families of what we call the single transferable vote system. Um, and this, this is, this is, um, this is connected to the idea of preferences. People often think that um, under a preferential system, your one, your number one vote is, is worth more than your number two and your number three and your number four. It's not. It's just another part of your vote. It's not worth more or it's not worth less. It, it, gets, it can be transferred to other candidates on the ballot paper. That's your vote. Your vote is moving. It's not getting weakened as it goes down the line. It's just that you didn't get your first preference because they either got excluded or they may have been elected and your vote can move on. The other aspect of, of the single transferable vote system is that your vote can be cut into pieces and moved about. And we'll go into that in a bit, a bit later, but that's, um, that's where, we, <coughs> where we see services come in, come in and, and, and we'll, we'll graphically show that um, fairly soon. Um, So like I said, um, the quota is the minimum number of votes a candidate needs to be certain of election. And we do that with a, with a, with a formula. And the formula is the, the number of formal votes. So again, you don't know how many that's going to be until you've, you've counted up all, all, the, um, all the actual votes and taken out any of the informal votes. The number of formal votes divided by the number of vacancies. So in the ACT, every seat in the ACT now is electing five members. Um, we used to have a seven member seat in the long vote, but all five electorates now have five vacancies. And you add one to that. Um, and then you add one to the, to the actual answer. And so if we look at that in a, in a single um, member seat, House of Representatives, number, number of votes divided by the number of vacancies, so it's one. And then you add one to that, so it's two. So you, therefore a half. And then you add one to that, meaning that two people can no longer get that number of votes in order to be elected. So that's the quota. In, in, a, in an ACT election, it's divided by six plus one. So it's, it's 16.6666 repeater is essentially the percentage a candidate needs to get in order to be elected in all five ACT seats. Um, so another aspect of, uh, that's quite unique to, to the ACT and shared with Tasmania, who also have hair clunk, uh, is Robson rotation, uh, and it's a way of printing ballot papers that um, so that every candidate within a column shares an equal number, an equal position within that column. Um, <coughs> columns on Hare Clark papers in the ACT that are released stay in the same position, um, but it's the candidates within that column that get rotated. And the idea there is that it reduces the influence of a donkey vote. People often think of a donkey vote as being an informal vote. It is not an informal vote. It's, a, it's an 
absolutely valid vote. Um, a, a donkey vote being one, two, three, four, five, straight down a column. Um, but as you can imagine, if, if, the, um, if 20 people walked into a polling place and you didn't have Robson rotation, 20 people who donkey voted would give their first preference to the candidate at the top of the list. And they would give their fifth press preference, let's admit that that's uh, five candidates, to the person at the bottom of the every time, which um, is not particularly fair. So in the ACT, we rotate those, those um, the names within the column. What that actually means is that there are 60 different versions of a ballot paper in an ACT electorate. So all five electorates have 60 different versions of the same ballot paper. It's just that the candidates are in a different order. And we'll, we'll, we'll see that. So just, just to ask something. So if you've got candidates A, B, C, D, E on one ballot paper, it'll be B, C, D, E, A. Yep. And, I'll and, and it'll be in that order. It, it does, you don't mix up the A, B, and C. So. I'll, I'll show you in a, in a couple of slides. Um, what it also means is that, uh, well, that there is also a ban on how to mark vote cards in the ACT within 100 metres of a polling place. Um, and what that, that together with Robson rotation means, um, because if someone was to hand you a, a how to vote card and Robson rotation exists, it's very hard for that party to get their how to vote card to match the ballot paper that you're going to get in a polling place. So, uh, so in essence, what that means is that it's the, the elector's choice. It's always the electors' preferences that decide ACT elections. It's very difficult for poll for parties to um, guide where your particular preferences flow. Unlike somewhere like the, the Senate, where it used to have ticket voting, we don't have ticket voting anymore, but prior to the recently passed federal election. Um, and this is where people were always talking about swapping preferences. People get a bit com confused with, with what swapping preferences mean. But, it, but federally, it meant for the Senate, if you put me, uh, if you put my party fourth on your ticket, I'll put you fourth on my ticket, and then we'll submit those to the Electoral Commission. And when you put them up, when someone puts a one for my party on a Senate ballot paper above the line, then you'll get the fourth preference on that. That was a preference deal. They can't so much do that these days. Um, but it also meant for House of Reps papers that you could hand them a how to vote card and say, well, on my how to vote cards, I'm going to put you three if you put me three, that kind of thing. We don't have that in the ACT. They can still do how to vote cards. There's no ban on how to vote cards. It's just very difficult with Robson rotation and the prohibition on handing them out within 100 metres of the polling place. Um, so this is a, an example of what a, a, a hair clamp ballot paper looks like. It's a 2012 um, paper. And as you can see, the, the, camp, the, the party columns across the paper, um, candidates within those columns, and then on the right-hand side here, the ungrouped. Now, on a, in the ACT, ungrouped, and ungrouped could be independent candidates, or it could be party candidates where the party has only uh, nominated one candidate for the, electorate, for the electorate. For a party to have its own column, it needs to um, register at least two, uh, two candidates. So that's what a, um, a paper looks like. It's got the instructions at the top, um, and, and if we look at some Robson rotation, so this is what, um, this is how Robson rotation used to work in the ACT and, and Tasmania. It doesn't work like this anymore, um, but it gives you a good example of what essentially happened. So if you look here, Jason Hinder at the top, this is from 2012, um, Jason Hinder third there, fourth, fifth, and second. On that one, so they all have a, a share there. This was a fairly limited version of Robson rotation, so it's really only five rotations. So we don't do it like that now. We do sixty rotations. What we found was that um, if there was a, an unsuccessful candidate within the party and they were being excluded, let's say for example here, um, Glenn McRae, then when Glenn McRae got uh, excluded. Because it was limited in this way, you would see that Mary Porter um, got a, quite a number of those flow-on um, preferences. And, and you could actually see the influence of that. Although it's limited, it's, it's better than, than no Robson rotation, there was still evidence of, of um, the impact of a donkey vote. So now we do... Oh, sorry, that's, I always do that. Skip that one. 
Now we do that. <laughs> and that's, that's an equal share of every single position. Um, now this is, a, this is a five member seat. So when we used to have Malonglo, seven member seats, it's exponential. So there were 420 versions of the same ballot paper. <laughs> so when did that start? Um, I think at the, at the first Hare Clark election in, in, in 92. 95. Um, but yeah, it, this is the version. This is the version that we we have now. You don't really need to know any of that, but um, it's just interesting. Um, but what we do now is we. So when we had to manually count, and by manually count I mean picking up actual ballot papers and shuffling them through candidates, um, it was a challenge because um, because the names were always in a different position. Um, now we now we. Um, digitally scan all of the ballot papers and use um, intelligent ca character recognition system uh, to count the ballot papers and it does it all for us which is, which is very nice. Um, it takes a lot less time. So how does Hair Clark work? So what we're going to do today <laughs> is we're going to use um, a graphical representation of Hair Clark using, <laughs> using champagne. Um, and so, so in this particular example, we're going to elect three, uh, three candidates. Um, and you need a bit of an imagination here. Uh, each vote is a drop of champagne. Uh, the champagne is coloured, can change colour, uh, and can have numbers written on it. Um, <laughs> and then all the, all the drops add up to just under four glasses. So that's essentially saying you can only elect Three. It's not possible to elect four. So this is the quota ID. Um, so the voters put their drop of glass in the candidate of their first choice, and the first three candidates with full glasses win. Um, one of the things you need to do with hair clark um, and proportional representation in general uh, is deal with when a candidate gets more than they actually need. We call that a surplus. In this example, it's where the glass is overflowing. And you need to deal with those, that overflowing, so you don't make a mess, before you can do other aspects of the count. Um, and the, the idea is also, if, if a candidate has no chance of winning, they're the, they're the person with the least amount of votes at that particular stage in the election, then they get excluded and, and you look at, at the voter's next choice. So we move on to our champagne glasses. Can everyone see colours decently there? Um, sometimes the projectors are... That. So, what, so what we have here, um, we have a quota of 6,001, it's a very simple, simplified example but it, it um, serves a, a purpose, um, and, and we can see here that, that blue has 10,000 votes already and is overflowing. This line here is the quota and, and, and has, um, is overflowing. Um, what we also see here is that red uh, has very few votes. And this is a very common um, situation in, in, in Hair Clark party systems where, um, if you, in this example, if you could imagine that Blue is a party leader and has a very high profile and therefore gets a lot of first preferences. Now, people only have one first preference to give. And what that means for some candidates within the same party column is that they don't get those first preferences. And so they often start on first preferences with very, very little. And on election night, people go, oh, that, this particular, this particular uh, member, they're gone, they've got nothing, they've got, they got no votes. Well, let, let's watch that particular column in this example to see how Hare Clark actually flows through. Um, and just again, for an example here, um, this is a, for, for this example uh, over on this side, is an is a ungrouped candidate. Um, and, and often um, don't have an actual running mate to, um, to, um, to work with. So, we'll, so to start off, uh, well, I'll open up. What do you think, think we do? What's the first thing that we would do in this account? Well, we distribute the surplus. We would distribute the surplus, that's right. And, and this is where we talk about the single... Blue, blue would be um, considered elected, yep. Yeah. And, um, 
and this is where the single transferable vote process comes in. So he's got 10,000 votes, he or she, um, but only needs 6,001. So round figures, they only need 0.6 of what they actually received to be elected, which means they don't need 0.4. What used to happen um, in something like the Senate was that they would go, all right, well, they don't need, uh, my math is terrible, but uh, 3,999 votes. Is that right? Yep. yep. Um, and so what we'll do is take a random sample from all of those and uh, find three, pull out 3,999 of them, look at the first preferences and distribute those to the remaining candidates. That's what they used to do. Used to do, and, and you can see, I'm sure, the problem with that particular method, because if anyone said, well, one, you're really only getting the preferences of those randomly selected people, which is um, probably not even arguably unfair. Just unfair. Um, but the other aspect of that is, if anyone was to do a recount, yeah. you'll get, get a different same. result, um, and that's problematic, as, as you can as you can imagine. So what what we do here is is distribute all of the votes, all ten thousand of those, but at a reduced value because they only need 0.6, <coughs> they leave 0.4 <coughs> in there. So this is the this is the idea of having a drop of champagne that you can slice. Okay, so we're going to slice it, leaving 0.6 in the jar, and distributing all of them, but all of the 0.4s elsewhere. And what you can see there is that they move on. And so here we find now that when you do that, it's often that those, those party leaders, and this is just an example, but those very high profile candidates who have running mates, it's the second preferences, it's the wishes of those, of the electors, where they go. So it's the transferring of that vote. Um, right, so, so you can see here now that the reds Red's um, moving up and, and Lime uh, got a few in, in that case. So who, who can tell me now what, what the next step will be in this, in this process? Kill one. Yeah, eliminate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, eliminate. Eliminate the ball. Yeah. No one Empty a glass. <laughs> drink. <laughs> drink. <laughs> drink. That's a, drink that's a pink. <laughs> yeah. So in, in this example, pink has no chance of winning. They're the person with the lowest amount of votes. They didn't receive any votes at the, from, from blue. Unlikely in a real scenario, um, but for this example, it, it um, in fact it's very unlikely that they only just vote to, but it shows it. The point. So, so yeah, so we now look at um, Pink's votes, and, and Pink, they're all first preference votes. They all came to Pink, number one Pink, and so they're going to another candidate wherever they go as a full vote. So this is the idea of the your second preference is worth the same as your first preference. Mm -hmm. And the same as your seventh preference. You've got to think of it as, as, a, as your wish. Did you get the first wish? Did, pink, did the people who voted for Pink no, didn't get their first wish? Are they going to get their second wish? Let's see. And that's, that's a really crucial <coughs> aspect of, of preferential voting that, that people don't necessarily understand. They think, well, my two's not worth as much. It is. It just depends on where the, 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 pre the preferences flow. So if we see that, <coughs> Pink's get... Pink gets distributed um, across uh, a number of different um, different candidates, um, but we can see here that although Green was very very successful in first preferences, had a big following in terms of number ones. It's in this example, it's a it's a um, it's limited to a particular aspect of the community who are really in favour of that particular candidate, but they're not getting those second preferences. They're not getting the third preferences. They're not getting any of the other flow on, which often, you know, if, if you run in a party, you might get, or um, this, is, this is just an example, but it, it shows that it's the preferences that matter often in order to get people over the line. Um, all right, so, so who, can, who can tell me um, now? You have to kill off line, I think. <laughs> so we look, no one, no one has been elected, so there's no surplus. I mean, it is possible. To be elected without a surplus, you've got to nail that quota right on the, on, on the nose, and it does happen, but quite quite rarely. But yeah, no one no one in that count got elected. So yes, we look we look at now 
excluding another candidate. But now Lyme has different papers. It's got papers from, from different accounts. And you've got to think, so we're um, mixing, mixing metaphors a little bit. It's oil and water. If they're, if, they, if they're worth the same, you can mix them. If they're worth different amounts, they've got to be treated separately. And in this particular scenario, green, or lime, sorry, their first preference counts, they got them number one green. They got those, number one pink, number two green. These ones here, these are the point fours from over here, so they're, they're not worth a full vote. Mm -hmm. So we can't treat those in, in the same count. So we exclude those and we take the pink and the lime and distribute them. Right, so we've now got uh, lime elected, reached, reached the quota, they're now over quota there. Um, who can tell me what I would do now? Distribute the red excess. Uh, actually, that's a good question. Do you just keep going with the line? Or yeah. do you uh, keep going with the line. The line. Yeah. You have to finish oh, someone yeah. off first. Yeah. 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 So, so now we're, now we're, um, re we're distributing those point fours, And they move as a point four. They move as a point four. So if we were to do that, we can see here that they start being distributed. Now they can't go to blue and they can't go to red because they've already been elected. They don't need any more votes so they can't get any more votes. So, so these, those particular votes may well have been uh, one blue, two pink, three red, but red can't get them. Red got elected in the last round. So it then went four yellow. And so it goes to, goes to yellow in, in that particular uh, example. What we also see here is that green, green started getting some, some preferences here because at this point in the count, it's either quite, possible, quite common for um, votes to exclude, uh, to, to exhaust. And exhausting a vote means um, if you were to write one, one blue, two red, um, and that's it, once you were... Well, let, let's say one blue, two red, three pink, just as an example. And it comes time to distribute those votes and there's no other preferences. It can't go anywhere, so it, it exhausts. And it takes no further part in the, in the process. Um, but it's also then quite common that people do number every single box on the ballot paper. And in fact, I would recommend that you do that. Um, that in, in terms of maximising your vote and your wishes, um, sometimes it's important, just as important to say who you don't want elected as it is who you do want elected. Um, but people do number every box, and so at some point, um, every, you know, this is quite likely that, that it's, if there's nowhere else to, for it to go, there's only two candidates left, it's got to go somewhere, it's going to be <coughs> um, And so now, um, of course, we need to, um, to distribute uh, red surplus, and so, um, this, is, this is what we call um, last parcel in, in, uh, in Hair Club. So, what, what we're doing here is, is only distributing the ballot papers that got red elected. Some other systems um, could take all of those ballot papers. I believe WA does something similar to this in their rules. Um, they would take all of those ballot papers and they would work out another transfer value. It's like averaging it out, almost. And so, what that's kind of doing is saying, well, these ones were received at 0.4, these ones were received at 0.6, so we're going to distribute them at 0.5. That's just an example, but again, not necessarily, a, it's arguable, arguable, but not necessarily fair, because some people's votes who aren't worth 0.5 are being given extra value, and some people's who are worth 0.6 are being transferred at 0.5, again, losing a bit of the power of their vote. So what we do in, in the ACT, it's all governed by the legislation, we don't get to decide any of this, but um, it's called last parcel, and we only distribute the ones that got them over the line, the last count. Um, and so in this case, it's the, it's the ones that came from pink. From lime? Uh, from lime, sorry. From lime. Um, and there we go, distributed. Um, yellow gets elected. Green gets very, very close. It doesn't get there. And the, that, again, like I said, it, 
it's, a, it, it's just to highlight the, the importance of preferences and, and um, you can get lots of first preferences, but if you're not going to, and, and if you don't get over the line with those first preferences, you've got to get the help of other ballot papers in order to get that quota. And you can see here that, um, that in, you know, there's very, very nearly four quotas, but there's not four quotas, it's just under four quotas. What happens if they ended up with exactly the same number? You, you, you can't, that's the quota. So there's the plus one. So, so in that last distribution, so that they each ended up with the same number of votes, you can't get that? No, because in order to get a quota, so if you're electing three, there isn't four quotas to get. I think what Neil's saying is just that the last line votes were distributed such that... But by definition you can't, because no, no, the total but, number well, well, that's, the not, the extra that's not the question. Sorry. Okay, well. okay. We're assuming that the yellow didn't get all of those greens and green oh, lines, and green got enough lines so that yellow and green ended up on the same number of votes, both not getting, both not getting a quota. What yeah, would some votes could be exhausted. Some votes could be exhausted. Yeah. And they both don't have to quota. Um, so, so you you. Um, in the very unlikely scenario, and this is this happens throughout the count, that if if there are people in, in the count who are at the same number of votes and you need to exclude one of them, you look at the previous counts and the first time that one was worth one had more than the other, it's the one that had less gets excluded at that point. And that's how you count um, count it out. Um, if you can't do that, because there's no previous counts where they're different or, or there are no no previous counts, which which is entirely possible in small elections where um, you know you, you have a small number of ballots, <coughs> a large number of candidates and the two lowest are five and that's the forget the first two five but five lots of first preferences on the first count you would draw a lot you put the names in a hat and you pick them out and that's that's in the act it's, it's yeah, so <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day if they both finished on you know uh, six thousand votes yellow and green right um or 6,020, whatever the numbers might be, uh, you would put, put them in a hat and draw them out. Well, you can't, you can't get four people getting quota. No, no, yeah, that's right. Not possible. But if, if at various different parts of the count um, that they ended up with exactly the same and there was no way of differentiating, then yes, you would put them in a hat to exclude oh, right. them. Okay. Not to elect them, to exclude them. And you'd have a similar process if in, in the first preferences if, uh, or after the distribution of the surplus, you had two candidates that are equal, were equal lowest, then you'd have some, had to find some way of... That, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 And it's drawing out of the hat. It's very unlikely <coughs> that people, you know, you know um, mm. an assembly election where you've got so many votes. It's possible, but it's very unlikely. It becomes more and more likely that the, the lower the number of votes you know, in an election. Yeah? So if blue goes off to the Senate or gets offered a job by the opposition, why do, they have to keep, why do they have to keep counting to see who's next when it should be obvious? Uh, because what you're actually doing in a, and that's called a casual vacancy, yeah. and what you're actually doing in a casual vacancy is isolating the votes that, that the retiring, resigning, deceased uh, member <coughs> received to get elected. We're not looking, so if it was, if it was here, Resigning. We're not looking at any of these, or well, in fact we are, we're looking at those. Um, so um, take the point six and just give it that. And it keeps its value, um, you know, in a, in a casual vacancy count back. But what you're doing, it's essentially saying the electors, the voters who elected the retiring member get to decide who replaces them. Um, and that is the end of the champagne. So I'm going to be there. Uh, is there any questions to that 2016 elections? Yep. So we rotate the candidates within a group. Why don't we rotate the parties across the because, across the because the Act tells us we don't have to. We can't. We rotate the numbers. No, 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 I'll accept. So then Dan Polly is in the list. Because, I mean, obviously, donkey votes. Many people start with the first column on the left. You go one, two, three, four, five. Good, I'm done. You'd actually, so the, you'd actually find that it's very, very limited that, that that's the case. It, um, it's it's not 
a um, it's not an effect that, that James Lionel would disagree with you. I yeah. suppose. <laughs> that's a different that's a different particular scenario. In the yes, the, but still, you've got scoring the first the pole position yeah. on that Senate. The paper. argument there, and David Lionel was, was re-elected, so yeah, yeah um, sure. But, but the argument there is that they shared a very similar name. Oh, I know. I, I um, accept that. But yeah, that um, that look look there would be an aspect of it. I'm sure of it, but I think it's pretty limited. And, um, and my, my reasoning on why you wouldn't do it is that it would be damn near impossible to screw any votes if you had to look for the person oh, and the party as it, well. But it, it would be extraordinarily <laughs> difficult. Um, but we don't do it because the Act tells us yep. what to do. That's good. Yes? Um, I always think um, I understand this, and, and you know, the true understanding is if I can explain it to someone else. Um, and I did throw out a challenge to my team recently that who could come up with the description in a paragraph or less. Um, I guess, if, you, if you've got it, I'll have it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we did a bit of search though. There's some, some great little videos from Tasmania that explain it in kind of cartoon form, really mm -hmm. simple way. I guess um, what I'm interested in, it says more information available, but even the PowerPoint presentation that you've just given, I think would be really useful. Is it? Are things like that available to direct people to? Or? Um, so we have a we have some education videos on our own website, but they yeah. don't necessarily go into this sort of um, <coughs> detail. Um, we do have fact sheets on Hair Clark. Um, they're not one paragraph. Um, but this, I mean, if you want this, you can have this. If you need to know, I guess the explanation that goes along with it, yeah. um, you probably take the live stream video. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, yeah. It, Tazzy does have some good stuff. Yeah. Actually, I had a couple of questions, <laughs> having been in it. Um, I was curious when you said that, you know, you encourage filling the entire thing out. Um, because, from what I've seen, um, it seems like the best thing you can do if you don't like someone or even a group, whatever, is just to leave it blank. In other words, by it putting something in there, you could inadvertently... But but which one do you like okay. the least? Yeah, okay. Well, most people and so if you're leaving them all blank, all the ones you don't like, um, and it, it's entirely up to the, to the elector, but if you watch that and you understand that, if your vote ex ex uh, exhausts, your wishes are gone. They, you, you, you either haven't elected anyone, depending on how the flow of preferences has gone, or you've helped elect one person and then trans the, the transfer in the surplus has gone to a certain point and then you're exhausted. Now, do you, do you dislike candidate F more than you dislike candidate G? If the answer is yes, then you want G more than you do F. Mm. And... Uh, and sometimes it's worth putting that on a ballot. Otherwise, you're not helping not get it. That would always be my suggestion. It, it, it is entirely, you do not have to do that. In fact, a single one is a formal vote. Um, but again, the Act tells us that the instructions on the ballot paper is mark as many names as there are candidates to elect. Uh, and yes, members to elect. Is it cross a vote? No, it is not. Ticks and crosses are ignored like they're not there. It has to be a numeral. Any form of numerals? So if I put one dot, two dots, three dots? Roman numerals is... A lot of it comes down to... Um, <laughs> no, I mean, we get it all the time. We yeah. get it all the time. Like dots on a, die, a dice. Um, look, all of those would, be, can, would need to be looked at in, in particular um, context of the ballot paper. But Roman numerals is a numeral. Yeah. And the act, the act again tells us that it has to be a new one. Um, Sanskrit or Chinese. Or look, if, if we can work out what the voter's intention is, and that's yeah. the, that is key, is the voter's intention. And although you could say a tick is a voter's intention, yeah, again, the act tells us that it has to be a preference or option. So, um, particularly crosses, people always go, oh, well, a cross could be negative or positive. And so, what's the be, voter's intention? Be a Roman ten. Sorry? <laughs> but, but see, that's a prime example of what I'm saying about the ballot paper in context. Is there a V1 and a, and a before it? Then we would we, then we would count it. But if it's one, two, three, like, whatever, I don't know what. <laughs> you know, and
and then an X, then that doesn't fit within the context and therefore it's, it would be ignored. Does helpful insights that are written on the ballot paper, does that invalidate? <laughs> the only thing that invalidates is making the identification of the elector known. Um, so if you write, um, oops, sorry, meant to write a seven, signed John Brown, <laughs> he couldn't count that. Um, it does so, Well, very rarely, actually. Um, you so, said someone else's name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the signing, signing is not necessarily, um, depends if we can read the signature or not. If it's just a scribble, um, we don't know, you know. So it's, that's a very unlikely informal vote, but it is possible. Um, given the uh, recent debacle with the census, um, I'm just wondering, is, is there any chance or any thoughts about moving towards electronic voting? <laughs> I get this every time. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we look at it uh, in between every election. Um, again, the Act tells us whether we can do these things or not, but we can make recommend it, recommendations to the, to the Assembly. Um, and personally, uh, I'm very wary of electronic voting in an online form. We have online voting in the ACT, have, have since 2001. Uh, it's in pre-poll centres only, and it's um, protected essentially by no <coughs> to an outside network. They're isolated lands. Um, I have big concerns over online voting, and, and it might have been a bit of a nail in the coffin of online voting, mm. the, 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 the APS issues. Um, the, my concerns with it, if you want to, if you want to um, fraudulently change an election in the current system, it takes a lot of effort for a very little actual effect. You know, you have to either go to multiple polling places. In fact, we even protect against that now. But um, <coughs> even if you were to get one ballot box and do something bad to that one ballot box, set it on fire, steal it, stuff it. You know, we have protections against that, but if you were to do that, the effect is fairly minimal. It takes a lot of effort. You put these things online, it can take one person, a 14-year-old, sitting in his, in his bedroom, much smarter than I am, with very little effort, and can essentially completely invalidate an election by either altering the result, or, um, or, or, or we may not even know. That's, that's, so that's, look, it's probably inevitable. Um, maybe less inevitable after the ABS issue. Um, but again, we do what the Act tells us to do. And if that's what Parliament introduces, that's what we implement. Um, but personally, I'm very nervous about the idea of online voting. So if it goes towards online voting, would you be using strictened or cyanide in your chalice? Yeah. <laughs> 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 helpful for them because they don't have to type it, type in. Well, yeah, yeah. well there's huge, huge advantages to electronic voting. Um, one, um, the biggest, the biggest informality vote that, that we will, that we see is people numbering every column one to five. So there's more than one number one. That is informal. You, to be formal, you can only have one first preference on a ballot paper. Um, electronic voting does not allow you to do that. Um, the only informal ballot paper you can submit on an electronic ballot paper is an intentional blank ballot paper. And that's legitimate. If you want to mark your name off and submit a completely blank ballot paper, it's informal, but it is a vote. But you can't skip numbers electronically. You can't repeat numbers. You can't do ticks and crosses. 
So that's a huge advantage of it. The other huge advantage is, is that because we do it, it's in free poll voting centres. Uh, last 2012, we got one in four people voting uh, electronically in the ACT. At about 15 minutes past six, when the polls close, 15 minutes after that, we can tell you 25% of the distribution of preferences like that. Takes all the fun out of looking back. Yes. Um, but, but in previous elections, so when we were electing 17 members, um, historically it's correctly pre uh, predicted, 15 minutes after the <coughs> debate, the polls close, 16 of those 17 members. You're doing your Anthony a good job. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he, he, he may well agree, agree to that. Um, because anyone here can, can look at that and, and see who, uh, on, on that sample, and it's a big sample size, one in four, it's a big sample size to see who's winning. We're not relying on Anthony Green to tell us what the swings are. It, it just, you know. um, and the other part of that is that if it's one in four votes that are electronic, only three in four votes need to be scanned and, and, and counted in, in terms of that distribution. So again, very it, it, scanning and electronic voting allows us to give you the result, the official result, on the Saturday after polling. That's one week. And we can't actually do it any quicker because we have to wait until the Friday for postal votes to come back. So we're often sitting around waiting for the postal vote, last delivery of postal votes, to actually scan those and tell you the result. Because it's so much, we used to take three weeks of lugging. It was horrible. It was, it was just horrible. In fact, I did it with a broken arm. That was even worse. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I assume it's only equipment that stops you putting electronic voting in every polling booth on that Saturday. It's two things. Uh, it's equipment and logistics. So it's very costly. Yeah. And logistically, it's 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 not like just setting up a couple of cardboard screens and sending yeah. the ballot papers out. You have to set up the, the, the network um, and, and you have to set up all of the computers and all of the monitors. For one day, that's actually a, 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 a lot of work. Um, the first time we tried, well, did electronic voting in 2001, we actually um, we did it in, in pre-poll centres, of which at that point there were four, and we did it uh, in four polling day polling places. Um, and we've never done it again. <laughs> One, because so many people pre-poll yeah. that there's very little gain in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers are, are small. You get maybe, you know, maybe 2,000 people voting at a, at a polling place. Pre-poll, we're getting 12,000. Uh, two three weeks. weeks in the ACT. Three yeah. weeks. Yeah. Um, and uh, those pre-poll voting centres on election day are also open. Technically, they're not pre-poll anymore. They're just a polling place, but they still have electronic voting. Can I ask one more? Yep. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting when you were showing the distribution, um, especially with the overflow. It sounds like if you, obviously you may have a few different people you're thinking of or not thinking of. It sounds like if you're thinking about where your preferences flow, you're better off putting your first preference not, let's say, with someone who has a big name or something like that. that if you put someone like that who's, who's going to get over, over, over the line, your next preference is you know, at a rather reduced value, whereas if you decide to put a number one with someone else, if it, you know, for whatever reason that person doesn't get elected, it goes at full value. So from what, I'm, what I'm seeing here is that ironically, because I know a lot of people tend to vote out of recognition, it's almost like you have to think about that and stop and say, okay, What's the whole picture of what I want to vote for? Yeah, that is definitely a, a way to think about yeah. um, your vote and what you want your vote to do. Um, I would not recommend or, mm. um, yeah. or, 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 or otherwise. Um, but again, your single transferable vote, if you do elect someone, it, it carries on. Yeah. And, it, um, and, it, and, and, it, and it helps what, you know, as your preferences describe. If you only do one or do four, and leave nothing up, then it might not carry on. Um, and you may not get any of your wishes or just some of them. Does electoral funding fo follow the vote? Uh, it does to a certain degree. So uh, um, uh, you need to get 4% of the vote in order to, 4% uh, of the first preferences in order to get public funding. Um, and then it's um, in this election, uh, and it goes up with CPI in future.
future. So yes, it's so in answer to so your question, it does have an effect to the funding. So, so in other words, when you say 4%, it's for that individual, is that correct? Uh, it's party. Okay. It's done by party, but in terms of ungrouped, yes, it's, it's, okay. it's an individual. Okay. Okay. But the, the funding is not just a fixed amount, it depends on how many votes you get. It depends on how many first preferences, mm -hmm. first preference votes you get, yes. And it's, it's, um, it's in this election, $8 per first preference vote. Mm. Just back to that question there, does that mean the people who voted one for blue actually ended up with 1.6 of a vote? So no. the first vote counted the first time, and then it all got distributed again? Not all of it, only 0.4 of it got distributed again. So their, their little drop of champagne okay, got four, sliced. Four and yeah. their, their first vote only counted as 0.6 because there was too uh, many okay. votes, and their yeah. second part was only counted as 0.4. That's right. If you take it out of the glass, that's the You leave 0.6 in the glass. <laughs> <laughs> glass is still full. Next, next time, can we have a practical demonstration? <laughs> 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 you, you want to drink lime champagne? Then we'll see what we can do. I was just wondering, would count that? So I'm kind of surprised that, considering how sophisticated it is for the actual real election, if you want to call it that, I'm surprised that with the countbacks, they don't just take let's say it's blue, for example, and say, okay, we're just going to rerun the election with the next preferences, you know what I'm saying? Well, that's, that, that, is what they, that is what they do. No, they, well, no, but they only, <coughs> they only isolate it just for that one candidate's vote, yeah, rather than you know, going through the entire election and <coughs> running it through the preferences. To see who actually likes like blue, like blue wasn't there. Yeah, it's well, blue wasn't there, and you just go to the next preference. Yeah, but, it, but it's it's the preferences that that again, it's looking at the wishes of the people who who elected that person. Now, treating it like that person wasn't there, their votes have gone elsewhere, and but other people, you've got to you've got to look at at where that who helps get that person elected. If if that person didn't exist, well, what did those people want? It's just as only half of what they um, No, you, you need to, we, we have to go back and identify all the ballot papers that got that person elected. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, manually, yeah. manually it's a nightmare. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, so the last hand casual vacancy we did, which was when um, Kate Carnell uh, resigned, that took uh, two to three weeks to count a casual vacancy. It now takes longer to actually read out the names of the candidates who are applying to be involved. And that's the other aspect. That it's not a... It, people... We write to every unsuccessful candidate in the electorate to say, do you want to be involved? Not all of them are involved. Um, not all of them put their hand up. But you push a button, it tells you who wins now. Um, it takes longer to print it out than it does to actually count it. So it sounds like that preference whisperer who was uh, around the traps earlier in the year, I suppose, they, they don't really have, you know, they don't really have that same kind of influence that say over a Senate, you know, the previous... Uh, uh, I always question it's a, it, it was a lot of, in my opinion, what he was doing. If you asked that particular person, tell me who, tell me who is going to get in, he couldn't, he, he could say it's going to be one of these seven, mm. maybe, but, but it, you, you never know where the preferences are. Um, Senate's a bit different because you know of the, of the um, you know of the preference deals, and so now you're right that when once those tickets are gone, it's uh, less less likely. Um, I'm going to be an independent candidate at the election, and so I'll be in that far right hand column with the ungrouped. What I noticed at the federal elections was it was quite hard to actually you know distinguish between the groups and the individuals in that last column. Um, so it just seemed as though that group is a bit disadvantaged um, the way that it's shown on the ballot paper. So is it going to look exactly the same, um, you know, in the ACT elections? So like we like we saw in that um, that example of the ballot paper. <laughs> it's a lot of, a lot of regurgitating of champagne. We might need to share, right? Oh, it's because everyone has it. Getting closer. Two more.
Um, so this is this is what a bell panel will look like. So ungrouped will be on the right hand side, and the candidates within here. Some some you can either decide to have independent underneath the name. You could not have independent underneath the name, or if they're a um, a candidate from a registered political party, and the party is only nominating one candidate for that electorate, then they would have the name of the, the party uh, under their name. Um, but that is where it'll be, and they'll be rotated, uh, like, a, like these are rotated also. Right, because I thought originally that the people in the in parties, that the columns are going to be rotated as well. So I thought that's another way that the um, independents are disadvantaged in that um, I, I understood that they just remain in the same position on the right hand side of the ballot paper, but you're saying that all of the, the parties remain in the same position on the ballot paper as well. All the column the columns do not move. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, depending on the number of ungrouped, um, there could be multiple columns. So um, there's five five candidates to a column, and so if there's six or seven, then um, there could be multiple columns of ungrouped. Does the Act say that the ungrouped column goes on the right hand side? Oh, yes. Everything's, everything's determined by legislation. If there's more than five, and they rotate, do they stay within their column though when they rotate, or do they rotate between the two columns? Okay. Stay within their column. Um, any other questions? How do you decide which those So we do a ballot draw. Um, so part of the ballot draw is the, the, the draw for column position. And we also do a ballot draw for starting position within columns, um, but that's really only relevant. Um, you can see down here there's a little code. So um, that's the Robson rotation code. And so the starting position is, uh, well, is shown up on code number one, and then they start rotating. That's, that's, that's all the ballot draw does for that. And then there's 60 of those. All done? Okay, let's uh, give a round of applause.